Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the weekly Kubert meeting. I'm your host, Chris Caligari, and uh, this is where we talk about Kubert issues and topics and, uh, and meet and greet with our developers. I'm posting our meeting notes to chat, so um, you're welcome to follow along. Um, please add your, your name to the attendance um, bullet point there so you can track who's been attending. And then I will share my screen. Okay. Everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. And once again, we have an empty agenda. So I'll give you a minute or two to uh, enter items. Okay, um, I think we should begin. Um, Alice has a, the first agenda item with BBC locking proposal. Uh, everybody, can you hear me? Oh. Yes, we can. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I sent this proposal two days ago, um, also in the mailing list. Um, I just would like to mention, and if you have any comments, um, feel free to add that. Uh, just to summarize briefly the, the issue. Um, so what I'm proposing is a new CRD with controllers. Um, and I would like to introduce a new mechanism to protect PVC. Um, this is particularly useful when we want to do um, disk operation, uh, for example, using libcastfs. Um, I, what I wonder about the PVC proposal is, uh, since the Kubernetes community is discussing the read write runs per pod mm -hmm. policy oh yeah there yep. it was the screen yeah they are probably not so interested in this pvc locking like described here and therefore i wonder if this would be most of them for qbert or still for Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. um so yeah, that's true. I just wondering if maybe there are the workload that use uh, shared storage. Oh. And that I mean, the the real issue with uh, the read write uh, one spot is that the storage can be attached to a single node. Okay, so, so it can by definition not be used by distributed applications basically yeah okay i mean it could be could be the case that you have a 
pipeline and the PVC could be attached to different nodes, just not at the same time, but um, it's more restrictive. I mean, if, if there are some workload that I have um, shared storage, that case, uh, that's too restrictive. And that's exactly what happened with the migration for Qbert. If it's mostly for Qbert and not for the, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it depends if if there would be interesting from a broader community yeah. in something like this or not. If not, then it may probably already be enough to just have an annotation or something on a PVC. Mm -hmm. And it would probably serve us the same purpose. So do you have the chance to go to the six storage meetings where these things are discussed? No, I haven't. Um, I just wanted to discuss it with you if you think it's something that has potential or, uh, but I, I can, of course, also uh, try to propose that in the, in the SIG storage in Kubernetes. Maybe we have some people from storage here. For me, it's a little bit hard to judge at the okay. moment because it didn't look lately into storage discussions on Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Henriksen is here. Maybe he has more insight in that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think like, uh, I think Alice already mentioned the, um, there's going to be a rewrite once node, which is, I think, um, will be the thing. Yeah, uh, but, but maybe you have more insights uh, if there, would also, there is a part of the community which would want to have more control, more in the direction like Alice proposed in this uh i don't know it's possible i i do think that there are this is one of those uh since we're getting into the realm of like you know uh, advisory locking there's kind of a lot of different ways to uh, skin this cat um but i i i definitely think that it is a problem that everyone has um and uh yeah, it, it, it may be worth discussion. Yeah, okay. Um, do you have any suggestions for Liche where to move on with the discussion on this? I can, I mean, they have a Slack channel in the Kubernetes. Uh, I, can, I can ask maybe if people have, um, have ideas. Um, I personally don't have uh, a use case outside Qvert. Um, so I, I had the chance to attend KubeCon in um, May, and I uh, there was some six storage um, talk, and I asked about uh, concurrency access to PVC, and they pointed me to this uh, read write one spot, um, but that doesn't apply to Kubert because of migration. So maybe there are other use cases outside that has the same problem. Yeah, I, I, I guess it's just hard to... Yeah. I mean, it, for, for scalable applications, it may be nice to have a faster way to get access to the PVC while it's still bound to another node in case of issues, but then you have the locking issue again, basically. Right, that you do not know when there are issues on that node and it's still bound there, then you don't know if you can already use it. So from that perspective, the read write runs part is the best one, but it because you first have to clearly unbind it, but of course it doesn't help us with migrations, like you said. Um so maybe I... maybe maybe for migrations we can also find with with the read write once part, maybe we can find another way there with the migration, like uh, delaying attaching the disk on the other node with post copy migration or, or first parsing the VM, moving the PVC over and then do pre copy migrations. I don't know. Maybe we can also explore this. Yeah, there. I'm just wondering if that turned out to be more complicated than. Uh, this uh, new mechanism with 
with the um, PVC locking. Yeah. I guess we would need more insights. Yeah. Like, in, like Michael said, in general, it's an issue one can have. And uh, yeah, there is the storage SIG meetings and there is mm -hmm. there the mailing list from Kubernetes. I guess that's a good. Yeah, I can do that. But Roman, so at least for our use case, um, I, I guess what I'm getting from you is you uh, think uh, you can come up with something that is perhaps, I don't know, simpler bit uh, in yeah, I, I guess our realm. Yeah, I guess all we need is a, a clear handover, right? And then their annotation or something would also be good enough just for our case. Yeah. Uh, okay. Who should annotate and remove the annotation? A controller, I guess. Like also behind this lock, there would be a controller. Where yeah, just exactly. Yeah. I'm. I mean, this is. I think pretty simple. It's just the controller uh, that watch the lock PVC and watch is also the owner, and then it just label the PVC and remove the label. Yeah. I'm using. I'm using the label because. Um, for annotation, you can override it um, with label if it's already labeled and somebody tries to label the PVC again, it just fails because the label um, exists. So that's a nice mechanism to allow that there is just a single owner. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Yeah, I mean, something like this can definitely make sense, but... I can definitely uh, mention that in the Kubernetes 6 storage group. So maybe there are people that are interested in that also. So Roman, do you think it would be um, worth coming up with and discussing a kind of more simple and direct solution for us? <sighs> I have, yeah, as I said, I have no, not enough insights in the storage discussions at the moment to say yeah. with Kubernetes. Um, well, I was hoping yeah. that you have it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely. Okay. And I think for, for us, uh, Alicia, I think you're the first one hitting this with your, um, mm -hmm. with your guest FS integration. Uh, but I mean, we have, for data volumes, for instance, a similar mechanism where we where we also do some checks in our controllers if we can use something. Yep. Maybe maybe you need in your case something more distributed, but but maybe we would maybe another option would for instance be to move the lib guest FS part more server side and away from Qt cuttle. Mm -hmm. Um so that it can just do the similar do similar things like with data volumes and PVCs, but in general, we're like the rest of Kubernetes is pretty weak regarding to ensuring that you're not overriding your stuff. So you can right now just bind one PVC to multiple VMIs. Yeah. And um, Roman, for, uh, when you mentioned the server side thing, what do you think about like potentially um, like a maintenance mode for a VM where uh, we could kind of um, start it in such a way that we can um, have exclusive access to a bunch of the disks. To uh, maybe I think what one thing what Alicia is hitting with the libguestfs support is that she, she's basically and Alicia, please correct me when I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. That she's basically uh, creating a pod completely out of bound of the rest of Qbert. Yeah. So, right, but I'm thinking of this maintenance mode. We could boot it in maintenance mode, and it would have the lib guest fs. It would boot up with the lib guest fs and and all the disks mounted in some canonical way. Ah, also, you mean in this way, it would be the whole VM would be basically mm -hmm. lib guest fs with this. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, maybe. So it's this worth is exploring. not part of the the PR that is open right now, but of course we can uh, increase it and. Yeah. It would be definitely a follow-up to your PR. Yeah. 
it yes, doesn't exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, 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 but Michael, it's an interesting idea, probably worth. And I think it, it, that applies pretty nicely with the volume group. So I think starting from Kubernetes 1.22, um, they are introducing this volume group and maybe you can just group uh, the volumes that belongs to the same VM in that way, so. Interesting. Yeah, anyway, I will, I will uh, try to ping uh, people in the Kubernetes storage and get feedback also from them. Maybe we are, we can find some additional user. Okay, so it sounds like two interesting needs. One to go to Kubernetes and the other one with the maintenance mode. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Elite That was a great discussion, everyone. Uh, Daniel Hiller has the next uh, couple bullet points. Uh, sorry for the uh, for the spamming in the uh, agenda. Um, I was just wanting to have a quick heads up for everyone that we have dropped support for Kubernetes 1.18 and lower for Kubert and Kubert CI lanes. So just so you know. Um, another thing that we, we have done is we have uh, merged Rooksev with six storage lanes. So they run now uh, all together with the Rooksev default provider from Kubert CI. Um, what we discovered was that when we were running the periodics that whenever the, the parallel tests were failing, the serial tests were not executed. We, we have fixed that with another PR, um, but still waiting for confirmation on whether that works exactly as we want. And what we also saw was that some tests were missing the labels for uh, Rooksev because that was required on some tests. I've um, attached the PRs on the, uh, on the agenda, uh, on the, on the uh, document, community document, if anyone is interested in looking into that. That's all for me, thanks. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, speaking of CI, um, Daniel and I moved CI for the website um, over to Prowl on, um, Sunday evening at midnight <laughs> for my time. <laughs> it was a uh, quite a quite a sprint, um, and we finished up uh, successfully. And surprisingly, our first pull request went through successfully, and that was pretty awesome to see. Thank you, Daniel, for that help. Um, I see uh, Nancy Jane is in is with us today. Um, they helped us with uh, the make file, uh, streamlining the make file and uh, making it bulletproof. Um, Chandler, John Herr, uh, a couple other folks have helped uh, with that make file also. And so hopefully that makes a uh, blog and, and uh, website contributions easier for everyone. Uh, take a look at the readme for, for details. And that is takes us to the end of the agenda and open floor. So if anybody has anything else to add? Um, now is your chance. Hey, Chris, I'll just uh, add, add one thing. This is Ryan. Oh, um, the uh, I posted also on the mailing list, but the um, we changed uh, SIG scale to go from bi-monthly to weekly. Same time, um, we'll be doing the same, um, everything the same, we're just gonna do it uh, more often now. So if folks wanna attend, uh, there is going to be um, two additional meetings per month. Oh yeah, thank you for reminding me about that, I forgot.
Hey, Brian, did you see that uh, thread in, uh, in Slack regarding that fellow who had a uh, memory issue on a high uh, density uh, virtual host? Yeah, I did. He, he messaged me. Um, I, I don't quite have a, a resolution just yet. I, I had mentioned to him that we should continue on the mailing list. Um, right. Yeah, just to see, like, yeah, just to see what else we can we can all dig up and, and see if we can find a solution. Yeah, he, has, he definitely has something going on there. Um, he's not running KSM, so there's probably an opportunity to reclaim some used memory pages or common memory pages. Uh, do you know of anybody who is uh, running KSM with, along with Kubert? No, I, I don't. Um, I, like I said, I think I think it would be worth having a discussion on the mailing list. It, it's strange. It seems to happen, like, like like he was saying when he was plugging in his devices, um, he would to sort of learn a little bit more. Um, it was just difficult to follow. I like having it. I think on the mailing list would be helpful. Sounds good. Okay. Um, pull requests. Oh, one second. Sorry, I, I forgot something. Um, I had a request from uh, Lugo um, whether we could have a look or whether we could. Uh, um, enter our uh, CI nodes. Uh, Federico, I see you are in the meeting. Do you uh, have access to the nodes where uh, jobs are running? And can you just, um, could you could you provide probably some some logs for Lugo? Yeah, uh, I think he, he, he needs to access the, the pods, not, not the nodes themselves, but the pods. Um, I think it can can be a little bit uh, difficult, but maybe maybe possible. Uh, not sure what what is the what he requires because if it is something uh, related to to logs or to artifacts, I think it would be it should be better to to just uh, modify the the test code to to um, write that, uh, that in the in the logs, but. But yeah, I'm I'm currently in touch with him, so yeah, let's, ah, let's yeah. see if we, okay. we can we can uh, continue with that. Okay, sorry, sorry for that. I was just not aware that that he was already in touch with you. Sorry for that. Yeah, 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 yeah no problem. And Federico, you have a GitHub issue or something to track that? No, I, I'm I, I'm not aware. Maybe maybe Lugo can can know better, but but yeah, no, not at the moment. I think I'll I'll uh, ask him and create one if it is needed. But yeah, hopefully hopefully we, we come we will we can come up with something that is reusable by, by everyone in in the jobs to give more information about what what's going on in, inside the bots something like that. That sounds good. Uh, in the meantime, I'll tag you on on this note right here. Right. I'll I'll update the document in case we we come up with hacking it habits. Great. Okay. Anything else? Okay. NC Jane has pull 449. Yeah, fixed architecture section for user guide. Oh yeah, okay. Um, conversation is ongoing here. Um, okay, I, I thought this was a new pull request, so uh, we'll continue the conversation in the in the GitHub pull request. Nice. 
unless you could, is there anything that you want to talk about in no, the meeting? I just wanted to ask whether we need to add the component section over here or not. Yeah, where is Roman? Do you have anything, any comment to add? Or Ryan? Ryan, are you there? I, yeah, I haven't reviewed this. Um, yeah, well, what's what's the ask? I haven't reviewed this. So we have the the problem is the user guide architecture section doesn't really make sense. So it's. it's like how to use a virtual machine doesn't really, none of this really details the, uh, the architecture of the, of the project. So we're trying to update this. And I was just wondering if we should add uh, the, the diagram that you guys came up with in the performance and scale meetings. Yeah, I there's a there. I mean, I'd like to. I mean, if um, for that diagram, I mean, there's an open pull request for it. Uh, I just don't have it. For, I don't know where it is, but the yeah, I would like to add that if possible. But um, yeah, the um, I mean. I'll have to review the rest of what's here. Okay. Um, Do you mind yeah, taking I mean, a look I mean, at this pull request? Uh, yeah, I can get through it. You can cool. assign me if you want. Yeah. I'll just tag you here and uh, just take a look at it and uh, uh, add some notes if uh, if you think anything is missing or um, tag it with how it looks good to me if you don't mind. And then uh, I'll uh, I'll do the approval so we can get a merge. Sure. Cool. Appreciate that. Okay. Thank you for your help on this, Nancy. Okay. Mailing list. Make sure all of our threads have been tended to. All right, OpenShift Council certificate problem. Hmm. Not sure about this OpenShift Council um, problem in relation to Kubert. Um, I think uh, this should be a support ticket. What does everyone think? Does anyone have any thoughts? This looks related to uh, an email that um, Alexander Wells already answered. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it is, it, is, it is that exact email, which I saw also today. But um, I think that uh, if you are using uh, the OpenShift console, um, he suggests that you are should rather use no, I don't think that is. 
I don't see it, to be honest. But, but yeah, I think he suggests that, that you use the hyperconverged uh, cluster operator for that because of uh, this interacts better. But then, yeah, I'm not sure, to be honest. Okay. I'm just going to, I don't know, every time uh, uh, a Red Hat product comes up, it really should be uh, running through the product support channels and then through the community. Missing SKI field and CA certificate. Is this guy's that's an spam? Okay, that's a after working on a CI certificate bug related to Kubert network components. That conversation is a year old, I think. You're still in the filter. Oh my gosh. I'm still searching on certificates. And thanks for catching that. I don't think we want to go back that far. Okay. Uh, I'm still searching on certificates. You can just remove the query in the, in the address bar and hit enter, and it should bring you back to Kubert Dev. Yeah. Oh, geez. My, my browser is going wild here. There we go. Okay. I think I'm just going to open up a new tab next time. I think it surely looks like everything is handled for the past week. Okay. Yes, everything is handled. So let's uh, move on to um, bug scrub, which we have not done in uh, the past couple weeks. So we need to do a good session today. Roman, I'm volunteering you. I think he's no longer here. Oh. He did drop. Would anybody else like to run it? I don't mind sharing the screen and going through it. Peter is here. Hey. Go ahead, Peter. All right. Can you see the screen? The right screen? Perfect. Okay. Um, I went through some, so I'd say let's just go, I don't know, 14, 20 days to the past. So. First one, post VMI shouldn't be marked as ready. Should they? Shouldn't they? Mm 
Does anybody have some opinion on this one? Uh, it's a readiness problem. Um, it, it is ready. It just posed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Like, post means it will not receive traffic, and the ready that's like the, what the ready status is for, no? Yeah, I mean, using this logic with the readiness probe doesn't sound that ready if you cannot use it. Yeah, or right. If like, ser other services cannot. Like the readiness, the readiness probe will not run. So, question is if not running means failed or op open, and I think it should mean failing because it's it's not succeeding. <laughs> I, I'm not sure if it's uh, even um, uh, tracking the VMI itself, or maybe just the VMI pod. Um, readiness probes on the pod uh, get reflected on a pod, and we have the controller updating the VMI with the respective readiness state if the pod readiness probe succeeds or fails, as far as I know. And it might just default to true. I, I, I don't know why, why it would be true if it's paused. Probably because it doesn't receive an update anymore. Any counter arguments? The question um, was the consequence. I mean, if it's a, if it won't be ready, it will be restarted, or what will happen then? I will not receive traffic from services. I think that's the only consequence. I don't even know if if we generate endpoints for services point to VMs. I think it's only for pods, and the pod will not be there, so it might not even have any change in consequence. But yeah. Okay. Yeah, or like a, a, a test proving that nothing else breaks. I don't know. Right, yeah, yeah. What's the uh what's the use case for this? Like why why would we um what would we want this? Um, I think it comes, I, I, I just assume it comes from the context of uh, this person is adding the readiness status to the uh, kubectl output for VMs. And it shows true for post VMs. And I think that's how it came up. I see. Um... Yeah, I, 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 why, I guess why they have to be related. Like, um, if you're, I mean, pause is its own condition. Like, um, uh, is there any relationship between the two? Like, I, I don't know. If, I almost don't see there is there being one. No, I think the readiness condition just means this resources ready to receive traffic to do anything and if the vm is paused it is not ready to do anything i suppose yeah i mean well like you guys are saying like i wonder if like the other consequences because um during um like when these when we do the phases like looking at ready is important like when we actually look at the pod is ready 
and I wonder how, um, like for handle, we'll, we'll look at this if it seems unready. Mm. Like, well, it's, well, like as we we, we, like, we instance, might just we, not. We mark this as running, like the phase is running. It's a, like running and paused is almost like like I mean and and ready like running and ready go together. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's it just kind of the relationship between all these things is kind of like I, I, what do we gain if we say like okay, pause shouldn't retrieve traffic if it's um, if it's paused. I'm just worried about the other consequences, maybe. Um. Yeah. One, yeah one, one, front. One. Oh, sorry, go for it, Kevin. Uh, yeah, no, I said one positive consequence would be the user might not get an error if there is multiple pods. I don't know what happens during migration, but um, but like that's not pod status. The pod readiness state is something different. I think this is just an oversight that we didn't don't update the VM status when pausing because the pod is still running and might not might or might not be reporting its readiness status. Yeah. I... So a readiness probe will, if you, as, as a pod, pass a readiness check, that means that Kubernetes should and can route network traffic to you. So all we're saying in this case is the VM's not going to respond. So probably not a great candidate for traffic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I understand that. I'll, uh, but like we make, there's as part of reconciling the VM, we make the judgment of, Okay, pod is ready. Move phase to running. Um, so I'm wondering what are the other cons if there are any other consequences around us seeing. Ah, so you're ready. saying this could actually imply if we turn readiness probe to false, then that could imply not running. Yeah, I, I don't know what's going to happen because because of how we do the reconciliation. There's a relationship between those the, the phase and, and being ready. Actually, I think I just came up with a with another problem regarding this um, with a new exec probes. If you pause your VM and you have a liveness exec probe, it will kill your pod all the time, and you can't actually pause a VM. I'm not sure, but, but that might happen. Because like the 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 pod is ready. Like we we like I, sort of separating them the pod and the, and the VMI, like the, the pod is ready and it can receive traffic and that's no problem. It's just the VMI is paused. And so maybe this is just one of those situations where like we're the keywords an abstraction and it's not like a perfect fit. I don't know. It would be good to hear like what, what other, you know, like a lot of, I think there's like a lot of testing that would need to be done to make sure that this is um, doesn't cause any adverse consequences and yeah, because it's not really not clear. And I, and I just the gain to me is not like like we, can we say like affirmatively like okay, um, this is going to get us um, this much of a improvement or um, something else. Um, is that that's that's also not clear. Like I understand the argument of like pause VM shouldn't be receiving traffic, but um, what are we getting? To some extent, we get user clarity when they query their virtual machines and they see that they are paused, that the readiness there does make sense. If we think this would make more sense, at least. But the pod, the pod is ready though. Like you but could, I can make the argument that I can make the argument that the pod is ready and the pod should yeah. be receiving traffic. But for the person querying virtual machines, they should not know or shouldn't have to know about the, there being a pod in the background. They query virtual machines and they know it's paused and they want to know if the virtual machine is ready for them. The pod, like the pod is an implementation detail. No. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess like it, this is it would be. Like the ready, ready is like it's part of the pod. Like it's almost like 
yeah i mean it's it just it's almost like it's not a perfect fit like if we if, if we had readiness as a part of the vmi object or like just something associated specifically with the vm and not the pod then to me i think that makes sense R readiness that's not what this is. readiness to me is the readiness of the workload that's why we have readiness probes that can do network checks and now do exit checks and um in the future have an exit uh, i guess ping probe um to see if the workload inside the vm is is ready to receive traffic same as the readiness probe in a pod does not check if the pod itself is ready but the check you execute on the pod your application size ready ideally so in our case the readiness should also indicate not if the pod itself is ready but your workload okay so you're saying that you can't you can actually just you can't actually link it to the workload you can actually link it to the, the vmi to the the QMU process so to speak yeah with the exit probe you can or we already have network probes like you can say you, you can set a, a readiness or a liveness probe that checks some port on your virtual machine sends tcp or http traffic to it and gets a response and that sets the readiness status of the pod and then the vmi if the pod sets its readiness status yeah Okay. Okay, so there there is time. Okay. And I think if you have a readiness probe and it's paused, it should fail and the readiness status should translate. I think this one fails because the pod does not have a readiness probe. So the pod will not be set to unready when you pause it. The VMI. Yeah, I mean I, I guess like for me like when when we see pause, I think I've seen his patch. Like if we see if if we see that the VM is paused, um, like that that means something as well. Like, yeah, I don't know. I I I I could see the argument being like, yeah, we we should we should be ready false um, because now we shouldn't receive traffic. I, I guess it really is just a concern of whether if there are any adverse consequences to this to doing this. I think there just needs to be a lot of testing. Petra, would you mind seeing me on this side? Don't forget about it. Yeah, it's also fine. Um, Thanks. Thanks. I will see if Ryan as well since he was so outspoken. Okay, um, let's move on. We have five minutes and if we do one more, we are at the end of uh, the week. Um, okay, so there's this one. Allow configuration of alternative kubelet directories. Uh, he attempted to install Covert and couldn't because the distribution that he uses uses non-standard kubelet directory. And Robin answered that we do have an option to change it on our handler, but it covers only partial. And he seems to be for this, seems like. Um, any reason not to do this, or do we have any workarounds that could be used without any changes to the code base. I'm surprised they mentioned K3S because I thought I had That's K0 as running successful. Yeah, but on the bottom I say also K3S and I'm surprised because I thought it works there. Yeah, we, we should work. Ah. Um is K0S still rancher? I don't even know what it is. Okay, I can uh, I can have my teammates take a look at um, those different providers. I know we have K3S on our near term radar for our, a new lab. I can add K0S also. Okay. Um. This doesn't look, but it sounds like we would need it anyway. 
So let me just mark this accepted unless anybody protests. Okay, we have two minutes. Let's try one more. Write files, run CMD, cloud Linux configuration not working for VM manifest. Um, I'm trying to configure it for data from my Ubuntu VM image from within CloudNet. Following our user guide, it linked to more examples from CloudNet docs. What? Photo to do it. Sample VM, oh, it's important, blah, blah, blah. They apply formatting, or is that something strange in that YAML? And the, my eyes cannot parse this. It sounds odd. It looks odd. What are those asterisks? Is he trying to bold out? Oh, yeah, he's I think trying he... to bold within a code block. Yeah. All right. That might be for the issue, and not not the actual YAML. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> right. So maybe I shouldn't have changed it anyway. Um, but maybe an indenting issue, could you share? Yes, to share the original config. Okay, so it needs more info. Let's leave it at that and yeah. Okay, we are five minutes to the top of the hour, and I think yeah. that's the end of our call. This is, Peter, this is also something that I can have my team revalidate. What you mean, though? The, the time or the, the, the issue? That user guide page for no cloud in it. Ah, right. Yeah, I mean, they're, right now we we don't try to. I'm um, looking for something to do anyway. So. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. I mean, right now the network data feature of CloudNet we don't really document it that well because we only show it in one example that's for a specific use case, and for the rest we link to like external docs. Um, so maybe it would be worth to give it more love and document it in detail. Yeah. Yeah, let's let's do that. Um, they're the guys are saying they're bored, and that's always a a good indicator of saying uh, <laughs> I need work, and this would be a good thing, a good thing for them. Yeah, uh, okay. let me know if you would need to, uh, want to like clarify anything on the network docs or whatnot. I would be glad to help. Sure. Well, thank you for handling that bug scrub. And sure. it is 7.57, and that concludes our weekly Kubert meeting. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll see you next week, or we'll see you on the mailing list or Slack. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chris. See you. Bye. See you all. Bye. Bye.